Hello, uh, thank you, Jordan, for your kind of introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, um, as you know, Dr. Kravich and I uh, will give you today a presentation on revision of collision convention. Uh, Arif actually gave perfect, perfect introduction to my part of the presentation, therefore I will be very brief. So, uh, Bracket Convention was adopted in 1910 and it was enforced in 1913, and practically uh, by the Second World War was had been uh, ratified by most major uh, seafaring countries. Uh, although at the time uh, of uh, the adoption, it was considered to be a comprehensive multilateral treaty with very modern legal solution. Uh, over the years, uh, some of its defici deficiencies uh, have been detected. Uh, moreover, over the years, uh, most of international conventions have been revised, and it was only logical to, con to consider to revise collision convention as well. Um, in addition, technological changes in uh, maritime industry um, raised so many questions even regarding collision rules, and those uh, questions uh, practically confirmed the need of amending this convention. Uh, finally, last year at uh, Antwerp Convention, um, CMI formed an international working group on collision convention, and um, John O'Connor Uh, John O'Connor uh, presented uh, some possible changes to the Coalition Convention and also announced the sending of questionnaire uh, to all uh, national maritime law associations. Uh, since our time for presentation is limited, I would only point out some of interesting questions uh, contained in this questionnaire. And uh, with regard to the opinion of the Russian American Law Association, of course. And afterwards, um, Dr. Kragic will elaborate the mandatory insurance question of mandatory insurance in more detail. So, um, the first question uh, is uh, Should the revised convention define uh, pollution? Uh, we think it should, of course, and uh, that definition should include any direct collision as well, where damage is caused to another vessel by waves generated by improper navigation of a vessel, and the case where a vessel suffers uh, damage by undertaking the maneuver or avoidance of impending collision situation created by improper navigation of another vessel. Uh, it should also include uh, cases of collision where both vessels are owned by the same beneficial owner. Uh, furthermore, uh, the 1910 uh, Collision Convention applies to collision of vessels, but does not feature a definition of a vessel. Uh, so another question is, should the revised convention define vessel? And if so, should the definition include all floating structures? Uh, in my opinion, as well as in the opinion of uh, most colleagues from Croatian Maritime Law Association, uh, the convention should define vessel, and the term should mean any seagoing and inland waterway vessel of any type, including including hydrofoil boats, air cushion vehicles, submersibles, floating craft, floating platforms, except when such platforms. Uh, are on location engaged in exploration, exploitation, or production of uh, seabed mineral resources. Uh, on the other hand, uh, fixed platforms, artificial islands, jet of rings, whilst on location and engaged in exploration or exploitation, should not be included uh, since uh, they cannot be involved in production. Uh, in addition, um, the revised convention should apply uh, to any collision between vessels, and this could be a collision between uh, inland waterway vessels, or between seagoing vessels, or between seagoing and inland waterway vessels, regardless of whether the collision took place at sea or in inland waterways.
And finally, uh, one of the things uh, questions presented the most uh, to Brussels Coalition Convention is the fact that uh, it did not precise which damages, damages were recoverable. And this deficiency was eliminated by uh, 1987 Lisbon rules issued by CMI that include detailed principles as to recoverable damages and their assessment in typical collision cases. Uh, by introducing new and improved convention, uh, we have an opportunity to amend this law, making the Lisbon rules a part of revised convention. So after this really short introduction, I give the floor to Dr. Kravitz. Thank you for your attention. So I'll be talking about mandatory insurance. And uh, I will start in an anecdote. Uh, there was a meeting in New York and uh, there was uh, a, a director of one of our shipyards. And it was quite a complicated finance scheme. And he was listening to a lawyer. And then they asked him, is it everything okay now? He said, no, no, I'm confused. Then another lawyer came in and tried to explain in much more details and said, it's now okay. I'm still confused by a much higher level. <laughs> so uh, when uh, Petra and myself, we were in Antwerp, and I heard all these arguments about monetary insurance, and I was quite confused. But now we have got the, the answers from the National American Law Association, and now I'm confused on much higher level. So I'm going to share my confusion with you today. So uh, don't pay attention to the details. We we'll go quickly through them. So just that you get an impression on what is at stake. So these are the answers to the question of mandatory insurance. Some said yes, some said no. And then again, direct actions. Some say yes, some say no, and it's the same pattern, except from Poland. Poland said yes to mandatory insurance, but no to direct action. Why? Because they want to emulate uh, the European directive on insurance. So, we have a no care. Lack of public interest, they say. Problems with uh, insurance and reinsurance structure. Vast majority of ships have liability insurance. Mandatory insurance requests strict liability. Other conventions already contain mandatory insurance. Instead of a ship can uh, not invoke IC, ICC, it has not adequate insurance. This is Malta. But if you are not adequate insured, then you cannot invoke ICC convention. I'm still confused. EU directive already uh, requires mandatory insurance. Yes, EU, but what's with the rest of the world? In practice, liability issues are solved without mandatory insurance. So, leave it as it is, Germans. It is not enough. Other securities like guarantees, bank guarantees, bonds, uh, letters of undertaking, the deposit should be addressed as well. And the loss prevention would be diminished if you have insurance. Well, shall we go quickly through some of them? Public interest. Now, these are conventions on the, your uh, left uh, side, which uh, left hand side, which are uh, which have uh, mandatory insurance, and the collision convention is on the other side. So, are we comparing apples with apples or apples with peers? So, what is lacking? The first argument is public interest, there is no public interest. And what is public interest? Whose interest is public interest? And why defining the public interest in such a challenge? It's very simple, because public interest involves by civilization or culture. So by 1970, it was not forbidden to beating twice. By 1960, Harsh parity was a norm, and nobody cared uh, about uh, 
and nobody wanted to stop that lady beating up children because it was a private sphere, totally no public interest. And nowadays, you have a uh, uh, ban on uh, the bullfighting and even using animals uh, for circus acts are forbidden because the public interest is now to uh, take care of uh, well-being of the animals as a free creature. So no abuse of the animals, no suffering for that. It's now public interest. So what is the public interest in protecting the damaged part by facilitating the recovery of its loss of damage? Is that a public interest? Yes. In many spheres, you have uh, mandatory insurance for professional liability for car accidents and so on and so forth. So we can have found some public interest in there. Now, what is with maritime law? In a store commitment case in 2013, two ships collided. So for cloud sunk and uh, lost, uh, and there were lost of life on board the ship, and another ship was stored commitment. They collided off Singapore. So the Torn for Cloud wanted to uh, sue the uh, you know, commitment liability insurer directly. And because Guard is located in Norway, so they brought the suit in Norway. So the Norwegian Insurance Act says that in the event the assured is insolvent, the injured party may claim compensation directly from the insurer. And the provision cannot be departed from to the detriment of the injured party. So direct action in Norway exists, and there are still some unsolved questions like insolvency, joinder, whether you can name the ship owner as well, together with liability insurance, and the limit of liability. I won't go into details, but it's very important that Norway uh, has that solution at the moment, because GAR and school, two large insurer uh, companies, uh, which are covering 20% of the world's fleet, are located in Norway. Then we have a case of use uh, change change. Uh, in 2015. Uh, the vessel uh, grounded at the island of Mykonos with 200 containers on board, and she became a total loss. The Turkish charters sued the Turkish owner in uh, Turkey and were not able to arrest the ship because the ship was a total loss. So what they decided? They decided to sue the ship owners mutual club in Turkey, which is liability insurer of the research technology. So the uh, Turkish commercial code says the victim may claim its loss up to the insured sum directly or from the insurer. So what uh, the PNI club did, they applied for anti-suit injunction in London, and the London court had to decide whether the claim um, that claim is a contractual one or it uh, gives an independent right of the claimant to sue the insurer. So they found that it is a contractual claim because uh, the uh, claimant steps in the shoes of the insurer. If it is so, that means that all the terms and conditions of the insurance contract would bind the claim. So it's the arbitration clause. And uh, the club said to the court, please stop the proceeding in Turkey because uh, we have agreement to arbitrate in London. In England, we have as well a suit direct action against uh, the 
liability insurer, but only in case of insolvency of the defendant. And uh, as well, it says that uh, if the insured, insured rights are transferred and based it in the third party. So you are bound with all the terms and conditions of the insurance contract. In the famous and celebrated cases of the funds in the islands, the pay to be paid rule was considered. And Lord Goffer warned the clubs not to use that uh, defense in case of uh, personal injury and death cases. And now it is part of the English law, which says that the transfer rights are not subject to legal detail condition, but in case of a infraction <laughs> contract by insurance, it only applies in respect of death or personal injury. So it's just for marine claims. And in Croatia, we have direct action against the insurer, but for the marine cases, we have marine, uh, maritime code, which says when specially prescribed for and in the cases of death and personal injury of the crew member, the claimant may claim directly from the insurer up to the limit of the insurer's obligation. We, we, may, uh, 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 we copied actually the solution of the uh, English uh, law. And uh, what it means is specially prescribed, so if we have patents convention or something else, if we have adopted another law, then we have direct action but not otherwise, in, in, uh, except uh, in the case of uh, the uh, crew member that or uh, uh, in the case of the person in the crew member. So in these countries, now you have direct action against the uh, uh, liability insurance, and it seems to be a growing threat. So what is EU solution? in practice. You have directive and uh, you, under that directive you must have uh, uh, insurance, uh, liability insurance in place either if the ship flies the flag of a member state or any ship which enters or leaves the waters of uh, EU uh, countries and that insurance covers maritime claims which of course, are uh, claims that that insured uh, emerged from a collision. So, if you have collision, then there is monetary insurance, but you cannot not reach the funds which sit in the in the uh, bank account of the insurer because it's too high. You must have the tools to reach them. So, what you do? So you have to arrest the ship, then the liability insurer comes to the sea, offers insurance, in the, usually in the form of the P&I club letter of guarantee, and in that guarantee they say that they will pay to you each sum or sums as may be judged uh, by a court in final, uh, uh, final uh, uh, decision of the court. And down it says that this undertaking shall be governed by English law and any dispute arising thereof shall be subject to the jurisdiction of the higher court. So, th this is the way to get the uh, uh, right to sue liability insurer because there is a dispute if there is a final judgment and uh, the liability insurer cannot honor it. So, now eventually we have that direct uh, link, but it is not prescribed by law, but there is no need for arrest, but you have the addition clause in the guarantee and you call on a body to cancel directly. And the insurer is now in direct uh, relation with the claim. So look at the moment at this fictitious, uh, fictitious case dilemma. 
there is Mary and John. And Mary has invested $30 million and bought this ship. And John invested $50 million in a fish farm. So if you have a collision, and very severe one, and uh, unfortunately, the ship struck Mary's uh, vessel, which was at anchorage, and a bunker spilled into the sea. Under the bunker convention, ships involved in uh, collision shall be jointly and severally liable, and the defenses are very weak. So, as a result, John would sue both insurers of one and, and, and the other vessel. But on the other hand, Mary can only sue the, the other ship, but cannot sue the liability insurer of the colliding vessel. And if that other vessel is a total loss, then she cannot even uh, arrest the ship. So, this is now Humbert and he thinks about that case. And he talks up why public policy protects John and not men. That is the question. Insurance industry always finds solutions to uh, serve the ship owners. So, you know that uh, argument about uh, complication in uh, issuing guarantees, uh, because there are a lot of insurance companies involved in each uh, uh, cover. But it's very simple, actually, and it happens every day. So if there is a collision, then the, we have car and machinery underwriters. The leader would get guaranteed from all the uh, underwriters on the slip and will then extend guarantee to the club. Club is insured, and the club is in position to issue uh, security in port, port, port. So the same uh, scheme is applicable. Either you issue a particular security, or you just issue a certificate under any convention which requires uh, mandatory insurance. And this, now this is the case as well and uh, you get a certificate or the, uh, the uh, for any uh, uh, mandatory insurance and uh, the uh, underwriter community will find a way to find an arrangement to honor that. So just uh, an example, uh, when uh, the uh, CLC convention was debated, the UK opposed to direct action to direct recourse against the insurer, except in the case where the ship owner is insolvent, and then provision for direct recourse would put the insurer in a substantial disadvantage because the ship owner would have little interest in assessing the in assisting the insurer in a defense action and would, in some cases, lessen the incentive for ship owner to do care. Well, it's nonsense. So, uh, this is one interesting example as well. When OPA 90 came into force, uh, the PI clubs uh, were afraid that uh, they would be exposed to unlimited liability. And uh, that was uh, a pressure on the PI clubs to find solutions. And there was a, a really a dramatic situation because a lot of ship owners didn't want to uh, trade to the United States or they were not able to trade to the United States because they uh, didn't have a proper certificate of insurance. That was a very dramatic meeting in uh, Bermuda. And that was a meeting when Dr. Katish and myself were together. He was leaving and I was taking over. And uh, we were uh, in, involved in that debate and were pressurizing and pressuring the club to come up with a solution. And they did. So they uh, established a trust. The ship, ship owners were beneficiaries. 
the assets of the trust were completely separated from the assets of the club, and the uh, CICO was issuing the guarantees to the ship owners, and uh, I was uh, sitting in the board of directors of SICO and uh, had opportunity to visit Bermuda once a year. So what is proposal for the future? You can find it in uh, Lex Mercatoria, and we think uh, that the same principle could be applied here as well. So applicable to our case is the, the, the key is following. Torco projects, the owners of Torco Cloud, would sue store tankers in contacted court and would have and would have to uh, achieve the final non-appealable judgment against uh, store tankers. And the judgment uh, would have a tempo syndicati within which time uh, the defendant has to honor the, the judgment. So if that time elapses, then the uh, claimant would have direct, not direct, but I would say enforcement action against uh, the insurer which is basically what happens every day in practice. You get a PI uh, uh, letter of undertaking, and uh, if you get the final uh, decision of the competent court, then you can go to the underwriter and execute damages. So this is my maybe uh, most uh, favorite uh, uh, argument. If we, if we are looking in the future, if the collision convention does not in, in, uh, introduce enforcement action, the parties will invoke a national law that allows direct action. So if he, there is no direct action or enforcement action under the convention, people will try to find the way to uh, sue the liability insurer under national law. So basically, if the drafters of the <coughs> convention would not like such solution, the, coll the collision convention should have to ban direct action. So otherwise, you would have no uniformity because in some countries you will have direct action, uh, which depends on the national law. In some other countries, you won't. And uh, this is, uh, they say, one of the most successful business books ever issued. And this is actually a story of two little men and two mice, which were looking uh, for the cheese. The little man used always to, gay, to go to the same room and uh, collect the cheese. And mice were going through the maze and trying to find another source of cheese. And the conclusion which the mice, mice right and wrote on the wall was, change happens, anticipate change, monitor change, stop the change, change, enjoy the change, and be ready to change quickly and enjoy the game and the game. Late professor Bram Payakasha used to tell us, study insurance law. It is the law of the future. Thank you.